Okay, I'm going to go back to speaker. There we go. All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining us today for the Shawnee County Extension Master Gardeners last presentation of our beginning gardening series, Spring Planting and Maintenance. Ecology is a rather new branch in science, and it is the study of relationships, relationships in a place and to a place. As gardeners, we gain a deep appreciation when we learn about these relationships. I would like to think the land, the air, the water, and the life that they provide. Here at K-State Research and Extension Shawnee County, we would like to acknowledge that we are on the ancestral lands of the indigenous Oshaiti Shakoin people, also known as the Great Sioux Nation. The indigenous people of the Great Plains were deemed Sioux by French trappers. Their name for themselves is Oshaiti Shakoin which means seven council fires and properly refers to the entire Great Plains tribal system. The seven council fires used to live and travel in huge areas covering what is now known as the Dakotas, Nebraska, and here in parts of Kansas like Shawnee County. And now the sovereign nations of the seven council fires are recognized by the United States government by their reservations after a brutal history of broken treaties and genocide. We are lucky today. We are lucky we have Shawnee County Extension Master Gardener Kevin Seek with us here. Kevin is passionate about so many things in life, just some of which are native Kansas plants, gardening for pollinators, and getting healthy produce in the hands of our food insecure neighbors. This presentation is being recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel. During the webinar, if we could keep our microphones muted and we can save some bandwidth by turning our cameras off. If you have any questions, our Shawnee County Horticulture Agent uh, Ariel Whiteley Knoll will be moderating the chat box. You can find that by hovering your mouse over your screen and pressing the icon that says chat and looks like a little speaking bubble. Or you can save your questions until the end where we can all turn our cameras back on and hopefully have a little discussion. Kevin, thank you for being here with us on this beautiful drizzly spring day. Thank you, glad to be here. I'm gonna admit all these other folks that have been waiting. And if you wanna share your screen. All right. Let me, there. All right, oops, back up here. All right, let's get this party started here. So as Leslie said, this is the third and uh, last webinar in our spring uh, gardening series. The first two were about garden site selection and soil consideration and the right plant in the right place. So I'm not gonna spend a lot of time talking about that stuff today but I do recommend that you uh, go visit our website and, uh, and watch the archive version of both of those really excellent uh, presentations by Linda Jekyll. So um, let me begin by telling you that uh, K-State Research and Extension is an affirmative action equal opportunity employer. And uh, we, uh, Shawnee County Master Gardeners is affiliated with them. And so, uh, you know, we always endeavor to be uh, inclusive and welcoming of the entire community uh, in working to fulfill our mission of improving our community through horticulture. So today's objectives are gonna be um, to learn the basics of flower and vegetable 
planting, flower and vegetable care, uh, the right time for pruning your trees and or for planting your trees and shrubs, and then the proper time for pruning, plant divisions. And then we're gonna talk about dealing with uh, major sources of plant problems. So let me begin by saying that there's some gardening uh, chores that you really wanna put off until the fall. Uh, like for example, all of these plants in this list uh, are better planted in the fall because that way they don't have to deal with the, um, the stress of our hot dry summers uh, as they're getting established. And those cool fall months allow them uh, some time to start putting some good roots down and get a little bit established, uh, start sucking up some nutrients. So they're all ready to hit the ground running when spring comes around. And a couple of good resources for you uh, when you're trying to decide what to, you need to take care of in your garden. Uh, our colleagues over in Johnson County have put together a really nice uh, month by month calendar that has tips on all different kinds of things that you may want to take care of during that month in your home landscape. And then the K-State Horticulture Newsletter comes out every month and it always has timely articles about uh, things that you might be dealing with in your own garden that you uh, have questions about. So it's a very excellent resource. Um, so some things that you do want to address in the spring are soil tests. That's a great uh, spring's the time to get out there and get the your soil tested. Uh, you know, healthy soil is the basis for good healthy plants. And uh, if you need to get a soil test done, we do them at the uh, extension office. The first one's free, and then I think they're about ten bucks after that. But uh, that way you can determine if your soil has everything it needs to uh, give your plants everything they need and if you, what you may need to do to amend it to have really excellent soil. Um, of course, there's stuff that, you're gonna, that you do want to plant in the spring, uh, stuff that needs pruning. Most plants are going to benefit from some fertilization in the spring and when you look on that fertilizer package, you're gonna see three numbers in a row that stand for these three letters, NPK. Nitrogen is the first one and you need that for strong, healthy foliage. Um, potassium is needed for stronger, healthier roots and blooms. And then phosphorus is needed for just overall plant vigor. Um, you may need to do some weed control uh, spring is a great time to top off your mulch or mulch areas that uh, might need some. And then there may be some cleanup that's necessary in spring. And here's a list of the different kind of plant categories that I'm going to talk about in today's webinar. Um, and so let's begin with our summer flowering bulbs. Um, so these are things like cannas and dahlias and glads. They're all the kind of bulbs that are not winter hardy in our hardiness zone of 6A. And uh, so you're gonna need to, um, they won't survive the winter. If you wanna carry them over the next year, you're gonna have to dig them up and then replant them every spring. Um, so Early to mid spring after the dangerous frost is the time to get those bulbs planted uh, about three times the depth of the bulb diameter. Bulbs like a fertilizer that uh, is low in nitrogen and high in phosphorus. So on that NPK, that middle number is the one that you want to be the highest. So bulb booster type fertilizer, bone meal are, um, good for your bulbs. And so like bone meal is generally gonna be like six, eight, zero or something like that. Um, then you wanna maintain good 
soil moisture down to at least about six inches. Bulbs like moist soil, they don't like soggy soil. They don't like getting their feet wet. And so that's where mulching can help you out because that's going to help maintain that even soil moisture. And it's also going to help with the uh, weed suppression. And then deadheading is just the practice of removing those uh, spit blooms. Uh, so as soon as uh, when the flower gets done blooming, you go ahead and snip it off. And then that's going to encourage these uh, uh, plants to put on more flowers. Um, next are annual uh, flowers. And an annual is just simply a plant that's going to grow for only one season. So true annuals are plants that complete their life cycle in that one season. You know, they, they grow, they flower, they go to seed, and then they die off all within that one season. But then we also have a number of uh, non-winter hardy perennials that um, we grow as annuals because they're not going to survive the winter. Um, and so but they're basically treated as an annual. So then you want to look at, uh, do you want to grow them from seed or transplants? Um, so, you know, what you, um, um, sorry. Um, so you're going to want to, um, decide which is best, seeds or transplants. Um, so you can just refer to the seed packet to see what they recommend. You can uh, talk to the people at the nursery to see um, what's going to be your best option. And a lot of times it kind of just depends on your own personal style of gardening. The time that you're going to plant your annuals depends on their cold hardiness. So you have your cold hardy annuals like your pansies and snapdragons that uh, can will tolerate some freezing temperatures. And so you can plant them real early, uh, um, even before the final frost date. Your semi hardy annuals are uh, your petunias and cosmos are an example. And those you can plant near that first frost date and they will give you some extended color into the fall. These cold hardy annuals, uh, because they don't like the hot weather, they like cooler weather, they're gonna die back during the, the heat, but you can plant another round of them in the fall to extend uh, your color into the uh, fall months as well. And then you have your non-cold hardy annuals, such as marigolds and zinnias that do prefer the more warmer weather and you're going to need to wait till the ground warms up and they're well past that final frost state to plant them. Um, you know, uh, plant them just below the soil surface. You want to cover up that root ball, but don't want to get them too deep. Um, a practice called uh, butterflying, which is just kind of crushing that root ball and loosening it up a little bit will help promote the roots spreading out into the soil to help get a good healthy root system established. And generally eight to six inches apart is a good spacing. You can refer to the label on the plant for more detailed information there. Uh, annuals, you're gonna want to water them thoroughly but infrequently. Best time to water is morning, so you don't have excess moisture sitting on the foliage of those plants, which can promote diseases amongst your annual flowers. And then again, good soil preparation, fertilizing, mulching, and deadheading are good practices with your annual flowers as well. Uh, for your vegetable garden, site selection is very important. Vegetables need lots of sun. So you're gonna need at least six hours of full sun. Um, more is gonna be better. Um, vegetables need well-drained, very fertile soil. So, you know, again, here's an example where a soil test is gonna be very important to make sure you got the best soil you can to get a good crop of produce this year. Uh, make sure you have easy access to water because vegetables need a lot of water. 
And you may even consider like a drip irrigation um, or soaker hoses to help um, uh, make it a little bit easier to water uh, those vegetables. You wanna protect them from the wind. Um, and so generally speaking, uh, with your wind, whatever kind of wind barrier you create about for each foot of height, you're gonna get six foot of protection from the wind. So a barrier five foot high would protect plants from the wind about 30 foot out from that barrier. So you don't need something real tall. Um, and um, then, you know, of course you don't want whatever uh, trellis or fence or whatever you're putting up, you don't want it to be shading any part of your garden to, uh, uh, you know, limit the amount of sunlight they're going to get. And then depending on your gardening style and preference, there's all different types of layouts, you know, rows, raised beds, um, a grid layout will help you uh, maximize the amount of vegetables you can get in a small space. And uh, think about vertical space too for your vining crops like beans or uh, maybe some tomato vines and, and that kind of thing. Uh, and this Kansas Garden Guide is an excellent resource for anybody that wants to know about uh, good vegetable gardening practices. And I think we can put the link to that in the chat box for you. Um, then you're gonna to wanna to think about crop selection. So you have your cool season and warm season crops. Cool season crops are ones that you're gonna to wanna to get in the ground here pretty quick. And uh, then they're going to grow into, um, you know, late spring, early summer, uh, which is about the time you're gonna be needing to get your warm season crops in. And then the cool season, uh, plant, uh, vegetables, you can, uh, about the time it's ready to start harvesting some of those warm season crops, you can go ahead and get a second cool season crop in. Um, and uh, crop rotation is very important. You don't want to plant the same plant, same type of plant in the same spot year after year because it's going to promote uh, soil borne pests in that area, particularly to that kind of plant. So you just rotate them uh, to prevent that from happening. And then it also helps with good soil because different plants are going to use up different types of nutrients or some plants that are legumes are actually going to fix uh, like nitrogen back into the soil for you. So three year rotation plan, you're going to choose hardy recommended varieties. And an excellent resource for you there is this um, extension and resource and <laughs> research and extension publication on recommended vegetable varieties that are all um, ones that have been researched by K State and determined to be uh, hardy in our region. And then uh, also this um, uh, vegetable planting guide like I was talking about, it has great information on uh, if you're growing it from seed, how long it's gonna take that seed to germinate, how much space a mature plant is gonna take up in your garden. Uh, it has this other little great little chart that shows you the best time to plant a crop and then the best time to harvest it. So those are really good resource, uh, reliable resources that you can access. And then K-State Garden Hour has been doing some excellent webinars and they just had one on planning your vegetable garden. And so if you want advice on planning a vegetable garden, I would highly recommend going to their website and, and checking that one out. Um, then let's talk a little bit about perennial and grass care. So Spring's a good time to divide perennials, you know, if they're getting a little crowded from previous years. Bulbs, if you're going to divide them, you want to wait till after the foliage dies back. Uh, mulching plants, I mean, we've already talked about the benefits of mulching, but, um, and then fertilizing uh, in early spring, uh, again, bulbs like that 
high um, potassium type fertilizer. Perennials want other perennials want a more balanced, a good balanced organic fertilizer is really excellent. You know, getting out and putting down a little top dressing of some compost is an excellent practice uh, in the spring. And then you may need to cut back some of last year's growth or, you know, uh, or remove it anyway. So like an example is like your irises. Um, maybe if you saw a little bit of leaf spots showing up last year, you want to get that the dead leaf litter out of there uh, to prevent that from reoccurring this season. Um, turf grass, um, if you need to spot treat for broadleaf weeds, early spring's a good time for that. Or if you've done a good job previously in controlling your broadleaf weeds, so you maybe can just go out and hand dig them. Um, if it's necessary to um, treat for crab grass, when the uh, red buds are in bloom is the best time to put down your pre-emergent crab grass preventer. And then fertilizing um, warm season lawns, like some fertilizer in the spring. And then if you have uh, cool season grass, you may wanna fertilize it if uh, your lawn is one that isn't gonna go dormant in the summer months like if you have a irrigation system in your lawn but bear in mind that there are a number of turf diseases that thrive in, when there's excess nitrogen in the environment so again here's a spot where a soil test is going to help you out because um, you know if your soil test tells you you have adequate nitrogen already you're gonna skip putting the fertilizer down and wait and apply that in the fall. And then ornamental grasses also uh, cutting them back before the new growth appears uh, is a good thing to do in the springtime. Um, but you know, when you're removing that old growth from the previous season, think about our native pollinators that help us out in the garden and you know, don't destroy that material right away. I, is my recommendation. Put it, throw it on a brush pile or pile it near your compost pile and then uh, let it set until the weather warms up later in the spring. And then you can go ahead and incorporate that in your compost or, you know, burn it or what have you. Um, and then tree and shrub care, ornamental shade and fruit trees. Uh, the best time to prune them is late winter and early spring before they start budding out. Um, spring flowering shrubs, you're gonna need to wait till after they flower and then that's a good time to be uh, pruning them up. Your berry bushes, uh, get out there and prune them before the new growth starts to appear. And um, another great uh, garden hour uh, webinar that they just, uh, had was uh, pruning like a pro. And if you want advice on pruning any of your ornamental plants, I really recommend that webinar. It was really good and very entertaining as well. And then mulching and fertilizing and watering are important as well, particularly if we've had a dry winter, you know, those uh, trees and shrubs are probably going to be getting pretty thirsty. So and um, oh, also with your mulch, you can mulch pretty deeply around your trees, but uh, make sure you don't put pile a bunch of mulch up right around the trunk of the tree. Leave a little space around the, the trunk of the tree so that little, uh, you know, um, uh, critters don't get up there to gnaw on your tree trunk. And um, then, you know, trees and shrubs need a good thorough watering. One good way to water your trees is to get you an old five gallon bucket, punch some holes in the bottom and then fill that up with water and then just let that sit there so the water can slowly seep into the soil. So now I'm gonna talk about solving some plant problems. So let me begin by talking about a thing called integrated pest management is something that we always recommend to people. It's um, it's really 
uh, it's an effective environmentally sensitive approach to pets management that relies on a combination of common sense practices where you're going to be using your knowledge of possible pests that might show up in your home landscape and then using that knowledge to manage their damage with the least possible hazard to the environment. So it's not just one type of pest management, but it's more a series of evaluations, decisions and controls, and you're using your awareness of that potential pest problem uh, to use this four-tiered approach. Um, which uh, begins with um, deciding what level of damage you're willing to accept on the plants in your home landscape. Then you're going to think about the fact that not insects, all insects or weeds or other living organisms re require control. Some uh, things aren't harmful and are even beneficial, but monitoring for pests and accurately identifying them, uh, you'll know what intervention is necessary and then what action may be appropriate. And then prevention is your first line of defense in IPN. So crop rotation or selection of plant, pest resistant plants, um, you know, our proper spacing of plants, those are all good examples of things you can do, preventative things you can do. And um, all of these things um, can be very effective and they prevent minimal risk to the environment. And then in the event that your preventative measures are no longer effective and pest control is necessary, IPM programs then evaluate the proper control method both for effectiveness and risk and effective pest controls with the least environmental impact are chosen first. And so here is my little example of a pest that we all love, the ever popular squash bug. And there she is laying her eggs on the bottom leaf of a squash leaf. Here's the eggs on the bottom of the squash leaf. Here's a bunch of the immature little bugs hanging out on the bottom of the squash leaf. So, you know, right away, you know that if you need to apply anything uh, to this plant to control this insect, you're gonna need to get it on the underside of the leaves for it to be effective. But maybe as a preventative measure, you could put down this row cover early in the spring to create a physical barrier to keep them squash bugs out, uh, you know, until you have to uncover it uh, when they bloom to let the, the beneficial pollinators in there to pollinate your plants. Um, but then you may also see this teeny tiny little wasp that's blown up in this picture in the center. And that little goomer is laying his eggs or her eggs in this squash bug egg. And then when its larva matured, it eats the squash bug larva. So if you see a bunch of these little parasitic wasps, you know, you already got some help controlling your squash bug. So maybe all you need to do is turn over those leaves and smash all the eggs that you see and let the wasps take care of the rest. Um, and you may not need to even spray. Um, So let's talk about environmental stress. That's gonna be your number one um, source of plant problems is environmental stress. And we have all kinds of stressors in our environment here in Kansas. You know, we have extreme heat and drought where good watering practices are gonna, you know, help you out there. Uh, Watering your trees and shrubs on warm winter days will, uh, will help uh, when those periods of drought come around because you will have put so, uh, moisture down deep into that subsoil. Uh, flooding can be an issue. If you were around here uh, last month, you know that extreme cold can be an issue in Kansas. And then, you know, wind, I mean, the, name Kansas comes from the name of the Kansa people 
uh, which means people of the south wind. Um, so, you know, wind is something that's very prevalent in our state. And so speaking of wind, here's a maple tree that's got some leaf scorch that was probably caused by some hot, dry wind blowing on it. Here's a couple of uh, examples of some damage to a tree trunk, but one of them is caused by heat scorch and the other one's caused from some frost damage. And then down here to the left, you have a couple plants that, you know, the damage is kind of similar. You see kind of droopy, you know, dying foliage, but this juniper was got way too wet. So that's from too much moisture and the dogwood is suffering from drought. So a lot of times these environmental stressors can look very similar. So uh, diagnosing them can be a bit of a challenge. And a good resource for you there is the Kansas MesoNet, which is um, a network of um, weather stations all around the state of Kansas that gather all kinds of useful information on their website like um, wind speed and relative humidity and precipitation and air and soil temperature. So that will help you um, because for example, like with that juniper we just looked at, uh, you know, a lot of times this kind of damage will happen months or seasons before it actually shows up in the plant. So, you know, you see your juniper looking like that, you're like, hmm, I wonder what the problem might be. You go to MesoNet and you look back and see, oh yeah, now I remember last spring was really wet. And that juniper, I remember for a, a few days, it was sitting there in some standing water. That might give you a clue to what the source of that problem is. And then like timing on uh, when to plant stuff, checking the, soil temperature area may be helpful when you're getting ready to plant some of this stuff. So that's a really good resource there. And I, I think we'll put the link to that up in the chat for you. Um, so let's talk a little bit about disease. Um, you know, very few plant problems are caused by disease, but um, just like with the insects and weeds and other plant problems, you need to know what you're dealing with and what to look for. Um, a lot of times disease issues show up in the spring because we've got uh, you know, ample moisture. Um, so there's higher humidity, maybe water standing on the leaves of plants that uh, creates the optimal condition for some of these foliar diseases. Um, but, uh, you know, some preventative things, proper spacing, pruning, good pruning and sanitation practices are gonna help re reduce these problems. But identification is a key, you know, here's another maple leaf that's got kind of a scorched area on there, but this is not uh, heat scorch, it's actually a disease called anthracnose. You see some damage to this tree trunk here, but that's a, that's a disease it's called slime flux or wetwood disease. It's not uh, environmental. Down here at the bottom are a couple uh, tomato leaves that um, have a foliar disease that in some respects are kind of similar uh, and they may show up right around the same time and knowing what you have is important to deciding how you're going to address that problem. Here in the center, we got a lilac with a whole lot of powdery mildew, which is a foliar disease that's common to a number of different types of plants. But um, you know, nowadays, a lot of plants have disease resistant that have varieties that are resistant to this powdery mildew. So if you select a plant uh, that's already resistant to this disease, it may not be much of a problem for you, even when you have the optimum growing con or disease conditions in your environment. Uh, weed control, again, identification is key. Uh, here, beginning of April, we're gonna, our response line will be starting up again and it runs through September. 
and we're always there to answer any of your gardening questions and help you uh, diagnose and solve any kind of gardening problems that you may encounter. Um, a lot of times hand pulling can be effective in the spring uh, in your garden beds. Um, and then uh, many spring weeds can just be controlled by mowing like this hen bed and chickweed up here. They're gonna die back when the weather gets hot anyway. So, uh, you know, you don't really need to, to spray them, you know, if uh, you might wanna pull some, but they may just need to be mowed off. Um, some stuff like crabgrass, like we talked about before, may be needed to be dealt with with a pre-emergent, but again, timing is key to that. You got to get the pre-emergent down there before that plant, uh, the seeds start to germinate, but close enough to germinate that it's going to have an effective knockdown. Uh, this dandelion here, well, you can see it's already in full bloom. Some of those uh, blooms are getting ready to go to seed, so it's probably a little late to get out there to try and treat for this plant, um, you know, you can dig them up. Um, or if you don't have that many of them, actually pollinators uh, uh, depend on, since dandelions are an early bloomer, this is a plant that they depend on as an early nectar source, um, you know, or you can hand dig them and, um, but uh, at this stage of the game, probably best to make a note on your calendar to get out there in the fall to treat them if it's a real problem. Um, oh, and then also I meant to say that one thing to bear in mind if you feel like you need to resort to herbicide application is that um, it always has the potential to harm non-target plants or even some beneficial insects. I mean, for example, uh, I live right across the street from the soccer fields over by K and I, and they love to get out there and spray for dandelions about the time that it's too late to spray for them, like in this picture here. And then I get this pesticide drift that blows over here and uh, kind of bothers my redbud trees. And so that's just one example of how herbicides can have a negative impact on non-target um, non species. Um, so insect control, um, again, you know, can't stress proper identification and familiarity with the life cycle of these creatures is very important. And also think about the fact that many insects are beneficial or don't really cause any uh, uh, serious harm to your home landscape. And, um, but uh, insect damage uh, is probably gonna be pretty minimal early in the spring, but that's the time to start monitoring and watching for it to appear. So you're ready to react as soon as you see a problem start to appear. You know, again, the response line is gonna be a great resource for you in uh, identifying and combating insect problems. But as an example, I have a picture of the beautiful black swallowtail butterfly up here. And they, their caterpillars love to dine on parsley and fennel and dill plants. Um, but you know, they're a native pollinator. They're a beautiful addition to your garden. And um, so if you're like me, you just plant extra dill plants out there to share with uh, your pollinate with these pollinators. Um, but here's another example of the importance of identification. Here's two green beetles that look kind of similar, but this guy in the middle, that is the dreaded Japanese beetle that may actually need some attention in your uh, home landscape, but this uh, this little goomer down here to the left is just the green June bug that is really pretty harmless, unless you end up with uh, 
a lot of these uh, white grubs in your lawn. Um, and then that's probably, if they're prevalent, there's probably other factors that are coming into play that are making that an attractive uh, place for those bugs. So in summary, um, I'm gonna harp on soil tests some more because good healthy plants start with a good healthy soil for them to grow in. Um, then if you wanna always make sure you're planting the right plant in the right place at the right time. So you're gonna to wanna to plant, put that plant in a place where it's gonna to wanna to thrive and get it planted at the proper time of year. Always use, uh, in, uh, 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 integrated pest management to battle those pest problems and you can always rely on us Shawnee County Extension Master Gardeners to answer any of those garden questions that you have. And now I'm ready to respond to any questions that we might have out there. And um, while I'm doing that, I'm going to pop up this little resource page. Um, for any uh, in case uh, you might be interested in checking out some of these resources. So any questions? Yes, we did have a couple of questions, but just in case you haven't had a chance, make sure to pop your question down in the chat box and we'll answer those now. So the first question is from Janet and she just wanted to know if it was best to plant your vegetables from east to west or north to south. Well, um, I mean, I think the main thing to think about there is you don't want uh, one plant shading out the other one, okay? So otherwise I don't think it really makes that much difference which direction your rows go, as long as they're getting uh, ample amount of sun. Awesome. And then uh, Georgina just loved all the resources you were sharing. So she asked about those. So we will be sending those out with the recording today, just so you can have all of these links that we've been throwing in the chat as we went along. Yeah, I had quite a few of them. <laughs> okay, so Mary Lou wants to know the proper way to deadhead or to prune back geraniums and then when that should be done. Oh, the proper way to do it. Well, uh, I mean, you're just gonna, when you see any dead, uh, when, you know, the bloom dies back is the time to go ahead and prune it off of there. Um, you know, I mean, it's probably a good practice to prune back to a leaf junction there. So you're not leaving a dead and withering, uh, you know, stem sticking out there. But other than that, I. I mean, I don't know if you have anything to add, Ariel, but that would be my recommendation. No, you're absolutely right. Usually the geranium flower head turns brown pretty quickly after it's done flowering. And I sometimes like to hand pick out the little florets that have started to brown just because a lot of times it'll start from the center and go out. And right. those little brown pieces ruin the flower for me, but that's just <laughs> kind of a personal preference. So... Uh, Sonia wanted to know if there were any local resources to purchase ladybugs. Hmm. Well, I'm not really sure, but what I would recommend is just contact, uh, you know, if there's a local nursery that you like, uh, contact them and, and, um, you know, see if they might have them available, um, you know, um, but yeah, I, I think it's always good to locally source stuff like that if you can. But if you can't find them locally, they're pretty easy to find on the internet. Yeah, and the important thing there is just to make sure, you know, like you were talking about with integrated pest management, that you have plants in your yard that are going to support them because ladybugs right. fly. <laughs> exactly. Uh, that was the other thing I was going to say is, you know, you may want to just go and inspect your yard and look and see if you already see uh, maybe some predatory insects that are going to be dining on those bugs like aphids and stuff that you don't want to have around because ladybugs, you can put them out in your garden, but if they're not finding, for example, enough aphids 
to support their diet, they're going to move on to find them someplace else. Yep, exactly. So we have a first time hydrangea grower and she wondered if you had any suggestions for growing hydrangeas. Um, my suggestion would be to contact your local <laughs> master gardeners and, and access the publication on growing hydrangeas because hydrangeas are one of those plants that they're kind of specific as far as the uh, type of soil that they like and, and so on. And, um, you know, the, correct me if I'm wrong, but the, the pH in the soil with some hydrangeas is going to affect the color of the bloom. And, um, you know, so those are considerations to take into account if you're trying to grow hydrangeas. Yeah, you're absolutely right about the soil pH. And I just put in a publication about pruning uh, hydrangeas from Johnson County that we use a lot. The really important thing is to make sure you know what kind of hydrangea you've selected, because right. in four or five years, if you forget, it's going to impact how you prune. So just making sure you hold on to those plant tags too. Yeah. And then we have one more question. Um, Shirley said, thank you so much for the presentation. I share your philosophy on planting for the critters. Do you have a favorite compost mix that you like to use? Oh, favorite compost mix? Well, um, no, uh, actually, I, I do what's called vermicomposting, where uh, it's a process where you uh, let uh, these little red, wig red wiggler worms eat your uh, vegetable scraps and they pretty much do all the work of turning that into compost for you. And then that's what I primarily use as compost in, in my yard. And uh, so I would recommend you know, checking out uh, some of our publications on composting and make your own compost because, you know, by doing it that way, any compost you buy or you're going to buy like at a nursery that's bagged, well, there's environmental impact to that. You know, it all has to be bagged somewhere, then it gets shipped here. Uh, so locally, the more locally sourced uh, uh, something like compost, the better, I think, in my opinion. Awesome. And I did put our making uh, compost for beginners publication in the chat because you're right. Yeah. That's a really good. Well, idea. plus making your own compost can be really fun too. So we have some suggestions that um, native oak leaf hydrangeas are really great. They don't require a lot of attention. And then Leslie said that we were just talking about our squirms of worms. <laughs> Uh, but then <laughs> Rhonda wants to know where you get your worms from. Where should those be sourced? Um, well, I don't know of anybody right here in town that has worms available. I got mine from a guy over by Manhattan. Um, but, uh, you know, if you're really interested in vermicomposting, uh, you might just get a hold of me and I probably got some extra worms I could help you get a bin started with and save you a little money. Worms to share. Yeah. And then also, the, I mean, they're easy to find online too, but I'm trying to think, you know, really the only, oh, no, there's another guy. Where is he at? Um, Oh gosh, I'm blanking on it now. There's another guy around here because uh, I've seen him at the farmer's market. Um, I think he's maybe from over in Lawrence or something, but uh, you know, but you could you could Google it, you know, I you know, just like Google Red Wigglers Kansas or something and see what pops up. But you know, same way, I mean, the same way with that. I mean, I, I'm a guy that likes to try and get stuff locally sourced instead of have stuff shipped in if I can. Absolutely. Well, that is all the questions that we had for you today, Kevin. Um, thank you so much for your program. Well, hey, thank, uh, thanks everyone for joining us today. I hope that uh, 
you know, you got some useful information today and happy gardening, everybody. Yes, thank you for joining us. Um, please be on the lookout for an email from our office professional, Kathy Bartles. She can email out a link to our YouTube channel that will have a copy of this presentation along with a list of all those URL links that we are putting in the chat box. And also our survey, if you wouldn't mind just taking a minute or two of your time, it really helps um, provide more resources like this in the future if you participate in our surveys. So thank you all, be on the lookout. We have another series uh, coming up in May and we'll try and do Tuesdays at two again and um, we'll be in touch. Thanks for joining us. Bye. Thank <laughs> you.